Hey everyone, this is Monica Staneda and today we're talking about how to pay your tree karma. I am the creator of the Nice Test of Feng Shui system, founder of Feng Shui for Us. If you are familiar with Feng Shui, you know that in Feng Shui we divide the home into nine spaces, nine areas, and one of those areas is devoted to wealth. The symbol for wealth is the tree, and specifically the tree as part of a living, thriving forest. So when you enhance your home for wealth, we often ask you to add trees to your property if you have enough room, or to use images of trees or even just living plants inside your home, and especially images of trees and images of forests in the wealth corner. In feng shui, trees have a very special place. Trees are considered like the people of the vegetable world. So it's like non-human persons, right? Whenever any of my clients has had to cut a tree because of whatever reason, you know, either because the tree was sick or because the tree was endangering the property, I always recommend that they plant four trees for every tree that they have to take down. And the reason for that is that wealth in feng shui works with the number four. Some years ago, I wanted to pay my tree karma. Because I was thinking, okay, you know, if you're going to build a home and you buy a lot and then you have to clear the space, then you're going to count the trees they are going to cut down in order to build or develop the land. But what happens when you have already bought a home, like the home we live in, we already bought it, it was already built, so we don't know that. So I actually uh, called the contractor and had him come to my place and give me an assessment of how many trees he thought would have been cut in order to build our home, which is a wooden frame. And he gave me an estimate of uh, 60 trees. So I thought, okay, so I have to plant 60 trees times four, and that would be 240 trees, right? But then I started thinking about other homes we have lived in and just the amount of paper that we use on a regular basis. And I decided that I wanted to plant 500 trees. And I started to do some research and I found that a lot of these nonprofit organizations that promise they're going to plant trees for you are actually scams or they don't deliver. For example, some people will just throw the seeds. They won't even dig up the dirt. They'll just throw the, uh, a bunch of seeds and hope that the trees grow. And uh, so there was little accountability, it seemed, and you couldn't actually know if the money that you donated was going to go to plant trees. And so I asked my friend Adela Espinosa, I've known her for many, many years. Most of my life, we were classmates since elementary school. And she's always been into the environment. So I contacted her, and she's in Ecuador, where I was born and raised. And I asked her, who could I trust to make a donation in order to plant trees? And so my friend told me about this uh, conservation project in Ecuador that is. Um, in uh, the Andes Mountains that is trying to restore the habitat of a particular type of hummingbird. And I'm going to have her today tell you about that. But she shared this with me and she and her husband, Antonio, had purchased property near the preserve. And so this was land that previously had been a cattle farm. All the trees had been cut for grazing. And so she and her husband had started a reforestation project and I became really intrigued by that. And I told her, hey, I want to help you. I want to make some donations and you can plant trees in, in my name. And Adela didn't actually know how much it cost. I remember at the time she had to make these calculations and, and go and check, you know, the cost of everything. And she came back with me with a number. And I said, OK, I want to plant 500 trees and we're going to do 100 trees per year. With me sending her my donations and her on her own, hiring people, getting the plants. We got to plant a few hundred trees, and uh, then something wonderful happened, and it is that Adela became connected to a foundation called the Hokotoko Foundation, and that we're going to share with you in this interview, the wonderful things that happened. It is very important for you that you pay your tree karma. In my opinion, this is the most important thing that we need to do for future generations to keep this planet healthy. And for all species, and especially for human life, planting trees. Because the world right now 
is in a young period. The world is uh, warming and trees increase yin. So planting trees is one of the most important things we can do right now. In the beginning, when I started working with Adela in order to plant these trees, she had told me, you know, your donations, you're not going to be able to take a tax deduction from that. And I said, well, I didn't care because it was more important to me to get this done than to get a tax um, credit. Now, with this association with the foundation Hokotoko, you can make donations to plant trees in a way that is reliable, that you know that money is going to go to plant the trees, and you can also get that tax deduction. And let me introduce you to Adela and her husband, Antonio. Hi, Moni. Hello, Moni. How are you? Hey guys, I'm so glad that you are here and I have some questions for you. First of all, I would like for you to share with us what the Foundation Hokotoko does. What is their mission? Okay, um, well, Foundation Hokotoko is a 20-year-old NGO uh, in, in Ecuador founded by ornithologists who wanted to protect the bird species that were uh, critically endangered. And for that, they purchased some purchased land in very, very specific ecosystems that did not have enough protection at the time. Over the years, the foundation has kept growing, the reserves have kept growing, and currently there are 16 reserves all over Ecuador that protect uh, endangered ecosystems. More than 60,000 acres. Yeah, 60,000 acres, more or less, that are protected. Uh, within the reserves of Hokotoko, there are more than 900 species of birds alone. Uh, of course, there are also hundreds of species of mammals and uh, amphibians and, and reptiles and plants, and of course, trees. Ecuador is a hot spot of biodiversity. biodiversity. Uh, one of the m most densely diverse uh, countries in the world. And I was going to ask you just that, you know, because some people might say, you know, why is it so important to contribute to a reforestation project in Ecuador as opposed to doing it anywhere else in the world? And part of that is to protect that amazing biodiversity, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, for example, one single hectare of of uh, lowland forest. Do you know how much that is in acres? Uh, well, people yeah. in the United States, they use acres. So in, in two acres of, of lowland forest in the west or the east of, the, of Ecuador, uh, you can have more tree species than the whole of North America. The whole, so in two acres, there's more biodiversity than the whole of North America. That's correct. That is pretty amazing. Yes, so it's, it's important to protect these uh, these uh, species, right? Yes, and and particularly that means that it's it's very difficult to try to replicate what nature does because it's so complex. Uh, you have to give nature the chance to recover and and give it the the most help you help you can give. Uh, so. Uh, over this, this many years, uh, Fundación Jocotoco has planted 1.6 million trees wow. within the reserves of the foundation. This is all native trees, right? All, all native, native trees for each of the their different ecosystems. Um, I think the count right now is something like 240 different species of trees that have been planted. In different in different zones, um, and also one thing that is very important is that the the reforestation projects uh, carried out by by the foundation are not uh, as you said it's not just like throwing seeds, not even just planting the trees because uh, most trees if you just plant them when they are very very small and they are in different conditions within with a lot of competition, uh, many of those trees may die. Actually, we had that with the project that with your donation we carried a few years ago that we planted, I can't remember, I think it was the first time 120 trees 
and from them, one night that there was uh, frost, some of them, actually most of them died, a high percentage of them died, so we had to plant them again. Yes. yes, I remember that happened. In a, another thing that I would like to point out is that the way you are doing it, you are not planting the seeds. You are actually planting the sapling, right? Yeah, that's so correct. There's, there's a much greater chance that that sapling will make it to an adult tree than a seed will make it to an adult tree. Mm -hmm. And so this is not these donations are not just for planting the tree, but for taking care of the tree pretty much until the tree can take care of itself. Yeah, that's that's right, and so that's why it. It is actually more expensive to maintain the tree over a period of, say, three years than the actual planting uh, and the sap sapling. Uh, that is the, the least of the, of the expenses. Uh, so maintaining maintenance is, is even more expensive than planting. Yeah. Um, so in a way, for us, uh, it was when we tried to start doing conservation work on our own, it was very difficult. Uh, we didn't have the knowledge, we didn't have the, the connections. And when we started working with Cocotoco Foundation and volunteering our time with them, uh, we realized how powerful it can be to work as a team with experts in different fields. So if the, there are experts in in reforestation and restoration of ecosystems, and they know what species to plant first, how to do the planting, uh, when. What, when to do the planting, uh, how to 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 do it so that the the forest can grow quickly back by it in, on its own. And so, Adela, would you tell us about specifically because we've heard about and the foundation Hokotoko, right? And uh, I imagine Hokotoko is a Quechua word. Actually, not. No, no, no. it is not. It's, it's a phonetic word. Yeah, it is a phonetic word. The foundation started in 1987 with the discovery of a bird in the southern part of Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And the name of the foundation comes from the local name that people there gave to the bird. So oh, it was that's the name of the bird. That's the name. That's how the, the locals call the bird, given the the call he made. So that it was like hop -a -hop -a -hop -a -hop -a -hop. That's how. Oh, that's, that's so cute. They call the foundation that way. Yeah. But, I, I know. I go on, Anthony. So I, I was just going to comment that many English names of birds are also like that. For example, a peewee. It's a name that resembles the call of the bird. But that's really interesting. So then I know the word the anacocha has got to be a Quechua word. Do you know what that means? It means uh, black lake. However, there are no, no black lakes, no lakes at all in the anacocha. So we don't know why it has that name. But that's, that's no, the people we'll call the area Yanacocha. But Adela, tell us about the project Yanacocha specifically, which is in the northern part of Ecuador, right? Yeah, it's in the northwest of Quito, mm -hmm. and on the slopes of the one of the our closest volcanoes, Volcán Pichincha. The idea there's a the the reserve that the foundation created there was to protect a special hummingbird, the uh, black-breasted pavlet, uh, which is black critically a black-breasted pavlet. Uh, it's a what about twelve centimeter long uh, hummingbird that has a black chest and has puff, puffs in the legs as the ones that the uh, cowboys wear here in Ecuador. Yeah. Barros that you might, might remember, that's how the, the bird got the name. So this bird is critically that's endangered. Is that the Samarillo that they call it? Yeah, el Samarro. That, that Samarro. Samarro. Mm -hmm. So the bird is Samarrito. Samarrito because it's oh. pequeñito. Okay. So that is a critically endangered bird that is located only in two parts in the northwestern of Ecuador, one of which is Tianacocha. So the idea there is to reforest the uh, 
pasturing lands and farmlands that had been there for years in order to recreate the habitat of the hummingbird. So that's the project in which you contributed early in March this year, in which in a very, uh, I think more than 5,000 trees were, not, not just trees, but five different species of plants that attract the hummingbird were planted in that, in that area in order to create the habitat and try to maintain the a very, very low population of the bird. That's great. So this bird, is, this is the place, and Anacocha is the, in this other reserve that you were talking about, where the only places in the whole world where we have these uh, little hummingbirds. And so when you and I first started, you know, we're just planting trees, and I remember we chose together five different species of trees and uh, hoping that with the presence of the trees, uh, more of the forest would be restored. But when you got in contact with the Foundation Hokotoko, tell that story of um, when you were talking to this guy and he said, why stop at trees? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it was, uh, we worked together with different organizations, one of which, for example, in this case, it's um, BirdLife International and Aves de Conservación, that are other organizations that protect the hummingbird. So when I was talking to him about what, what you generously donated, he said, can you find more friends like her? And can we do that together so that, you know, the resources can expand and the work can expand also. So he was, he was hoping that we could find more people like you that would like to contribute and get involved in these types of projects. Not just to plant trees, but, you know, to support conservation in many different ways. Yes, and uh, um, so, and, and I remember that, you know, but he had said something about why stop at trees, why not restore the whole forest? Yeah. Right? But yeah, I remember you told me that, that he had said, you know, one of the things was, well, why stop at trees? Mm -hmm. Why don't we just restore the whole original forest? And that's how the the 500 trees that I had planned on the, um, planting at some point, that's when that became 5,000 or almost 5,000 plants, right? That's correct. Uh, well, the, the, the area of Yanacocha is, is an area of Paramo. It's a um, high, high mountain Islands, right? Paramo is islands. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so being so high, being cold and with less oxygen, uh, and it's also a very, a very um, irregular area with huge slopes and, and crevices and, and rivers and ravines. So um, it's an area where there is not a huge forest with with large trees. It's more an area where there's a combination of trees and shrubs and flowering plants and uh, all sorts of different uh, bushes. And this is what makes the Yanacocha forest so particular. It's a it's a high mountain cloud forest. It's very humid, but it's also very high up and uh, in Yanacocha, there are, there, besides the black breasted public, which is critically endangered, there are about 20 more species of hummingbirds that, of course, live out from this huge diversity of, of flowers. Some flowers are from the trees, but most flowers are from, mm -hmm. from bushes and smaller plants. And I guess, you know, that's something that we we didn't focus on before, like where, okay, so we're going to get the trees, hoping the forest will restore itself, but we didn't think about, okay, what are the hummingbirds going to eat, right? And so this, uh, this um, planting of the almost 5,000 plants took care of that, providing the food. So I know that it's also, you said there's about 20 species of hummingbirds, which I can believe the abundance I think Ecuador has over 120 species of hummingbirds. Six. For people, huh? 136 now, with the recently wow. discovered two years ago. Recently discovered, so 136 species of hummingbirds in a little country, which is the state, the size of the state of Colorado, whereas in 
all of the southeastern United States, there's two species of hummingbirds, you know, so it's really important to conserve this, um, this area. And uh, you had also mentioned there was a, um, a blue-chested hummingbird. Uh, the blue-throated. Blue-throated. The blue-throated the blue-throated hummingbird uh, in Quito. No, the, no. the blue-throated hummingbird was discovered as a new species to science. It was no no one had ever seen this bird. Well, probably the locals had, but didn't know it was a different species. Uh, it was just discovered in 2017. Uh, so Recently. that's quite surprising because birds are they 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 are very much studied. All over the world, it's very rare to discover a new species of bird uh, at this point in time. Um, most of the new species of birds are separated with genetics. They determined that one one species that they thought the ornithologists thought it was just one species happened to be two different species that are very very much related. Uh, but this one is a, a completely new species. It's a beautiful hummingbird. It's also a, a highland hummingbird. It lives uh, about 12,000, 11, 12,000 uh, feet high up in the mountains. They can live even above, higher than that. Above sea level or yeah. even higher. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they, they have a very restricted range. So the latest the uh, reserve that was created by last week Fundacion Hokotoko just <laughs> last week maybe a, a few days ago uh, it was finalized uh, the the first lot of land in the area was bought uh, and so the reserve was officially created the idea there is also to restore the landscape not with trees because it's so high that there are in practically Indian. no trees there but there are some particular bushes. Uh, one in the one is called Chukidawa. You must remember that with with an orange flower. Uh, that's the main source of, of uh, food for this kind of hummingbird. So uh, the uh, the foundation is going to to replant thousands of Chukidawas and other plants in the area to try to maintain the population of this hummingbird as well. That is amazing. No, so we have expanded, uh, Adela and I, in the beginning, we were focusing on trees. And I thought that was such a good fit with feng shui because the tree is the symbol of wealth in feng shui. But it is the tree not isolated, not by itself, but as part of a healthy, thriving forest. You know, And that means uh, the, the undergrowth, the bushes, the flowers, and the, and the animals that feed from those uh, plants. And so I'm really excited about doing this. I, I remember when um, I talked with Adelita, you know, we, we had a phone call, and she told me, you're going to have credit for the rest of your life with this tree planting that's going to happen. Because our, our idea of planting 500 trees all of a sudden became uh, planting uh, almost 5,000 plants. So tell us about that. Tell us about the, how that happened. This event, this, this big planting event that happened in March, and that I know a lot of the indigenous people of the area contributed. And uh, for a moment, we thought it was going to be canceled. And, and then it, it actually did happen. Yeah. The, and, and that was a, you know, going through a um, project with uh, Ave de Conservación that was leading this these, uh, reforestation project. The idea was that they are planting even in... Um, in land that belonged to the to the peasants there, to the farmers there. So the idea was to work together with different schools that would do the planting. So there were two like elementary schools, schools, high schools. What kind of schools? High schools, high schools in uh, from Quito. The idea was that they would do the uh, aves y conservación had already the uh, the plantings and saplings. the saplings, the saplings. And so, of course, the idea was to plant as many trees in a day as that could be. But then the pandemic came, uh, we got in lockdown. So all those plants that they had already had for a year, growing for a year before the planting, were at risk of being lost. So the community there, especially the women, 
decided that they could not let this project go. And since it was away from the city and, you know, in the, the farmland, the countryside of Quito, they, it was, you know, open air, so there was no risk of, um, of getting the virus. So they decided to carry out the, the project and continue with the reforestation. So that's how they said, okay, how do we get this? And I said, well, my friend sent, contributed with this amount of money in order to um, work with her karma. How would you say that? Pay her karma? <laughs> Pay the tree karma. <laughs> <laughs> Pay the tree karma. So I said, well, this is what we have. If we work together, what we can get. So the idea was they had the, the, the plants. So they said, okay, so with that money, we can pay the ladies for their planting work. So that's what we need. And we had that plant in our, our uh, property and they ended up being more than 5,000 trees because that's what needed to be, to be planted. Oh, I thought it was almost 5,000, so it was actually more than 5,000. It was more, it, it ended up being more than, than 5,000. Yeah, I was really happy about that because I, I wanted to link this project to helping women. And so I was really happy about that. And, and I know, you know, they were careful and they kept their distance and they were outside. They were not being reckless, but they, they wanted to protect these plants, you know, to prevent them from dying. Because mm -hmm. they had already been set up to be ready to be planted, and if they would not plant it, they were at risk of dying. So, what do you need right now? What does the Proyecto Anacocha need right now? And uh, if people send you donations, you know, to, uh, most of the focus is going to be on planting trees and restoring the forest. And uh, so, what do you need from them, and how would the donations be used? Well, the uh, Anacocha. Uh, uh, is a as, as we had already said it's a highland uh, area and in the past it had uh, been deforested mm, mostly because mm, the trees were turned into into coal into charcoal uh, mm, and so there are and also to to have pasture land for cows so there's plenty of area that needs to be restored still within the reserve and in the surrounding areas. Mm. We currently have a, a project where we have a large, um, nursery? large nursery with, with uh, water and, and all the necessary equipment to grow the, the seeds, the saplings of trees and other kinds of plants that are good for the, for the birds and the hummingbirds. Uh, we are currently uh, raising 10,000 trees there, but of course, if we get more resources, we can expand that. So, uh, for every four dollars and fifty cents that that we receive as donations, uh, we can mm, plant a tree and maintain it for the for the following three four years until it matures. That's and amazing for just yeah. 50. Yeah. And so it's basically it's $4.50 per tree. And that yeah. includes uh, taking care of the tree for three to four years, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and yeah. Even, I mean, with that, with that amount of money, we can even guarantee that for those trees that die for whatever reason, they can be replaced with another one so that we can guarantee that it will be a tree. At, uh, after four years, there will be a tree will that, will, there, right? that will be living and that will survive for many more years ahead. And of course, there's also, with those for $1.50, you also contribute with the salary of the person that's in charge of the trees and taking care of them and, you know, planting the seeds or the... Uh, sapling. The sap, no, well, yeah, the mm -hmm. sapling. So it, it's also a source of labor for people from the community. So yeah. it's not just the tree, it's also the, the human side of the, um, the, the restoration of the whole ecosystem, including the indigenous people who live there. So that's why 
one reason we're so passionate about this. As, as you have mentioned already, uh, a Cocotoco Foundation has grown enough that we now have a sister organization, also called Cocotoco Conservation Foundation, which is based in U.S. Uh, it's a Chicago-based NGO. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that for, for Americans that, who donate to Hokotoko, U.S., they will get a tax receipt, uh, yes, which they can deduct they can from, their, tax from, their, from their taxes. Yeah. Yes. And all those, re those uh, donations, which are earmarked, say, in this case, for reforestation, uh, all that, that money is transferred to Ecuador to, to carry out the project. The, the reason that you can promise all this for just four dollars and fifty cents for one tree is the the amount is that the quantity right because you are going to be planting uh, tens of thousands of trees and so when you put all that money together in a, a country like Ecuador which is a developing country and there's a, a quite different standard of living that's why you're able to to stretch those four dollars fifty so much right that would probably be impossible to to promise that in the United States that for 450 you're going to take care of a tree for three years. And so it's a, part of it is the exchange, right? I mean, we still use dollars. We do use dollars in Ecuador, but the standard of living is still very different. The cost of living is a lot less in Ecuador. Thank you so much, uh, Antonio and Adela, for making this time to speak with me and to share with us about these important projects. Is there anything else you would like our audience to know before we say goodbye? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> now, I, I would like to thank you because getting your support is really important. And of course, the way that you are helping us to spread the word of what Hokotoko does, it's also very meaningful. I mean, little by little, we expand our network of supporters that not necessarily need to be Great supports. I mean, everything counts. The funds that we get are not only for land purchase, but what's needed the most is uh, operational costs to support, you know, the salary of a park guard, the salary of people who work at the office. And, and that's how we get conservation going. So by you spreading the word, by you telling your friends what Popotoko does and how to support, you're giving us a great help. And so you out there may be asking how many trees you need to plant in order to pay your tree karma, in order to foment your own wealth, because wealth is about growth. That's why it's symbolized by the tree and the living forest. And so from talking with contractors and doing some calculations, my recommendation is that you plant at least 100 trees for every 1,000 square feet in your home. If your home is a 1,000 square feet, plant 100 trees. If your home is 5,000 square feet, plant 500 trees. And that's just the beginning. You know, that's just to, to be even with your consumption of trees in order for you to live the life that you enjoy living. But that is the bare minimum so that you can do a physical, energetic, and spiritual contribution to trees because trees, to protect the future of this planet, to protect the future of these children, and to create beauty, harmony, and peace.